Um, I'm hoping that this will be a, a relatively uh, gentle talk, but uh, let me start out with some context that everybody already knows anyway. But um, okay, so we're going to be talking about about expanders, and as everybody knows, an expander is just a graph where every vertex set has has lots of edges coming out of it. So and. Formally, we define an expansion ratio, which measures the number of edges coming out of, of each set, and then take the minimum overall sets of size less than half the graph. Um, OK, so uh, there's been a lot of work on trying to construct expander graphs in lots of interesting different ways. The, the classical way is to do it randomly. So to just take a random regular graph, and then this gives you uh, an expander graph. And work on that goes back to the, to the early 70s. It's usually attributed to Pinsker, but I think recently people have noted that uh, Barjdin and Kolmogorov um, also had work in this direction, maybe a little earlier. Um, the first explicit uh, construction of expander graphs was due to Margulis, who used representation theory. Um, and there are several other things, so I won't spend so much time on, on each of them. So, um, so there's the Ramanujan graphs of Margulis and Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak. There's this zigzag product construction due to Rheingold, Vidan, and Vigdersen. Um, random lifts, which recently have been used by Marcus Spielman and Srivastava to prove that there are bipartite Ramanujan graphs of all orders. Um, and the thing that I really want to talk about, which is um, how you construct using Cayley graphs, um, how you construct expander graphs. Um, okay. So uh, again, as everybody knows, uh, a Cayley graph is just you take a group, you take some subset of the group, and then you join two elements if and only if their, their difference is one of the elements within, within S. So, and there are lots of examples of, of Cayley graphs. So the standard examples that are, are trotted out are usually the Paley graph, where the set of differences is just the set of quadratic residues, and the uh, lubotsky phillips sarnak Sarnak graphs, um, which are more complicated, but, I, but they are still Cayley graphs. Um, so how do you use Cayley graphs to construct expander graphs? Well, Cayley graphs tend to have the property that they, they tend to be very good expander graphs. Um, so one of the, the classical theorems in this direction is the theorem of Allen and Reuchmann that says that if you take any finite group and let just take a random subset, and the random subset can be pretty small, actually. You can take it to have logarithmic size in the size of the group. Then it turns out that the resulting Cayley graph is, is an expander. So the 100 log you can ignore. It's just some, some large constant times, times log. Uh, then basically a logarithmic size set produces an expander graph. Um, OK. Uh, this log factor is actually necessary in a lot of cases. So for example, if you're working over um, z2 to the t, then, uh, well, you need at least t things, t elements to form a basis. So to even be connected, you need at least t things. So, so you need at least logarithmically many things to be connected. And this says that actually just a little bit more implies that you're not only connected, but you're actually an expander. So, so this result is essentially tight. But with that said, um, there's a relatively recent theorem due to Briard, Green, Gralnik, and Tau, which says that if you're working in a finite simple group uh, of Lie type, uh, actually it's true for any, well, for a general finite simple group, you don't necessarily take this size two, but, but if you're of Lie type, then you can just take two elements. And the two elements, you need to take their inverses as well, so there's actually four, four elements. Uh, then the resulting Cayley graph is an expander with high probability. Uh, I'll trust you on that. Yeah, a bounded rank. Um, okay. Um, so where did I copy this from? All right, so of bounded rank. Um, uh, it's also true for the alternating group, for example, but you need to take more than two elements. Uh, okay. I thought that what the result of Kasabov says that if you, if you have an alternating group and you take 100 elements, then... Oh, there exists. There exists. Okay. Okay. So it's yes. Okay, okay. Um, so you should tell what horizontally, I know. You should tell what horizontally, like SLNP. 
If you fix n and let p varies, then this results is correct. Yes. If you fix p and let n go to infinity, and then it doesn't work. I see. So this is why the banded rank. The way we think about the alternating group a n is SL SLN over the field of order one. I see. That's the philosophy. Okay, so as I'm saying here, this builds on work of Lubotsky, amongst others. So, um, <laughs> um, so. No, I tell you, what, what, what is true? No, there is a serious issue. What is true, which was against early expectations? So that uh, the, 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 some of the philosophy here is not is really not clear. There are, there are in all this game, there are like best case generators, random case generators, and worst case generators. Mm -hmm. The best case generators is essentially completely true, namely for all finite simple group, there exists a, fi a fixed K, so that all finite simple groups have K generators which are epsilon expander with the same epsilon. Mm -hmm. Now you can ask the same question for random, and there is even a question about worst case generators. Now the worst case generators certainly needs the rank to be bounded, but it's still not known, but it's mm -hmm. not true horizontally. Okay. The random is completely not clear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there are several open questions here. <laughs> um, the, uh, the actual thing that I'm going to use is Alan Reuchman rather than this. I wanted to sort of advertise this. But, um, okay, so... Uh, Again, everybody knows this, so um, when I talk about spectrum, I'm going to talk just about the adjacency matrix. So, um, so you take the adjacency matrix, and then we take the eigenvalue. So, um, and the largest eigenvalue is just the, the degree, and the smallest one, if it's bipartite, is minus the degree, and everything else in between should hopefully be smaller if you're an expander graph. Um, and of course, the main result, uh, or one of the main results involving this, is that if all the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix except the largest are smaller than lambda, then you can say that between any two sets, x and y, the number of edges is close to the, what uh, it is in a random graph, um, up to some, some small factor here. Um, and I included this uh, more complicated looking expression here because if you take y is equal to x complement, then you end up with, uh, it basically tells you that you are actually an expander. So, so just using this doesn't give you the, the expansion, but if you use this, you, you know that it's actually an expander. Um, okay, so just as a, an aside, which is uh, uh, slightly out of the way of the main body of the talk, let me mention for a second some of the, the converses of, of this statement. So, um, so one converse, due to uh, Billu and Lineal and their work on random lifts, uh, says that there, there is a converse of this up to some, some log factor. So if you know that this condition holds, this expander mixing condition, then every eigenvalue is equal to uh, this eta here times some, some log factor. Um, and this is sharp, actually. This is basically best possible. Um, a recent result due to myself and uh, Yu Fei Zhao shows that actually there's a slightly funny thing, but if you're working within Cayley graphs, then knowing this condition, in fact, knowing even a weaker condition where you can just replace this with an n, uh, allows you to bootstrap. So it allows you to say that actually the eigenvalues are bounded by some, some multiple of, of lambda. And actually, that then you can plug back into the expander of mixing lemma to get this stronger statement. So somehow within Cayley graphs, this weak statement implies this, this stronger statement. Of course, trying to find uh, some example or some place where this is useful um, is so actually Bilo and Lineal originally derived it because they were able to prove a statement like this about random lifts, which then gives you back the spectrum. But in general, this condition is probably harder to, to verify than just finding the spectrum. But, but it's interesting that the two are more or less equivalent. We lose some constant. Um, it's like a factor of eight coming from the Grothendieck inequality. But, but as I said, this is, is an aside. Uh, the main thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, Actually, yeah. First, firstly, let me just say that Alan Reichman in the abelian case is very easy to prove. And the reason for that is that, well, you can write out explicitly what the eigenvalues are. If you just take a character, then you just sum 
over the elements of your generating set of the characters. If this is a random set, then they're sort of distributed randomly on the unit circle. And if you add them up, they should typically be around uh, root d in size. If you want all n of them to be, to be small, then you can guarantee that um, all of them are less than root d times, times log n with high probability. Um, so, uh, so in particular, if you take log n here, you end up that the log I, so if you take something bigger than log n, then this lambda will be smaller than the degree. Um, so, so actually, in the abelian case, it's very easy. There's also a generalization to the general case, which is just building on this idea, just using representations, irreducible representations instead of characters. Um, it's not so hard. Okay, so what I actually wanted to talk about is this uh, high-dimensional case. So the first thing that you come, up, come across if you try and think about what are the natural hypergraph generalizations of expanders is that the first thing that we noted on the first page is that probabilistic methods don't work. Um, so why is that? Um, so wh what do we actually mean by hypergraph expander? We'd like to have the property that if we take some collection, let's think about the three uniform case. Um, so edges have size three. We'd like it to have the property that if you take a bunch of pairs that are contained in at least one edge, then there should be many triples containing those pairs. So in particular, if you have a particular pair that's contained in at least one triple, it should be contained in, in many triples. Um, so, and that's not something that's satisfied by a random graph. If you just take a random regular hypergraph, then typically most pairs that are contained in a triple uh, will just be contained in that one triple. They won't be contained in, in many triples. So that's, that's a, a bad start here. Um, of course, you can, you can do various tricks to try and get around this. So, so one thing that you can do is um, you, can, you can start with some graph. Let's say you start with an expander graph and then look at its neighborhood and then draw a sort of complete graph on that neighborhood. Um, then it's definitely the case that any pair you have in here is going to be contained in lots of triples because it's connected to everything in here. But it won't actually have any good expansion properties. So for example, if you try and do a random walk, and a random walk works like this in this context. So you start at a given pair, then you walk to a different pair that's contained in a triple with the first pair. So if you sort of pass from pair to pair using these triples, uh, then these guys get stuck inside here. There's no reason why you should be able to leave these, these neighborhoods. Um, and it seems that actually guaranteeing these, these two conditions, that somehow every edge contains, uh, sorry, every pair is in lots of triples. In fact, let's try and make every pair in the same number of triples. And also this condition that you should be able to randomly walk around seem to be quite hard to guarantee together. Um, now, the, the standard way of doing this, of finding a bounded degree um, object which satisfies these conditions, is to use uh, these Ramanujan complexes due to Lubotsky, Samuels, Vigne, and to Lee. Um, so and these are finite quotients of, of affine buildings. And I guess if you were here yesterday, you'd have seen more about this. So, um, so what I would like to do is actually to, to talk about how one can come up with uh, alternative constructions of these things, hopefully satisfying fairly strong properties. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about how you can come up with fairly sparse hypergraphs with strong expansion properties, but which are also randomizable in the same way that the Allen Reichmann theorem is, is randomizable. So you can just take a random set of generators and, and produce an object that's, that's quite nice. Um, there has been lots of work um, trying to come up with alternative constructions of these kinds of things. So, uh, one of the natural things you can do is uh, one of the standard ways of producing random regular graphs is to use something called a configuration model. And you can generalize the configuration model. So there's work by, uh, by Lubotsky and Meshulam and by Lubotsky, Luria, and Rosenthal um, where they, they generalize this. But it tends to only work at density 1 over n. So if you have n vertices, uh, it tends to be the case that the pairs have, have degree around n instead of having degree around um, but just constant, which is what, what you'd like. So you end up with sort of n squared triples instead of n triples. Um, 
There has been some, some recent work by uh, Kaufman and Oppenheim where they found a, a very nice alternate example of uh, a, what they call a local spectral expander, um, which I think needs to have more work done in that general area. Um, what I'd like to talk about is what I think is actually a very simple way of constructing these things. Um, so, so here's the, the idea. Um, so let's fix a group. So we're going to fix on um, F2 to the T, um, so just an elementary abelian 2 group. And let's just pick some random subset of that. <coughs> and my hypergraph is going to be the thing that I said over there wouldn't work, which is you take uh, every vertex, you look at um, all triples, or you look at x plus s1, x plus s2, and x plus s3. So you draw. Um, so you start with any given x. Um, then you look at all of these elements here. So you get x plus s1, x plus s2, x plus s3, all the way around. And then you just draw all of these triples. So, um, so and my claim is that if you're working within f2 to the t, this thing actually gives you uh, a good expander. So um, an alternative way to look at this is as the triangles in a certain Cayley graph. So the Cayley graph you're interested in is you start with some set S, and then you form the, uh, the restricted sum set where you omit zero. Um, and then you look at this Cayley graph. So you're going to get a certain Cayley graph. And then the triples within this three uniform hypergraph are just the triangles inside here. Um, so, all right, so the picture is basically what I was drawing over here. So you have this, this x at the center. You look in the Cayley graph um, generated by s. You look at all the things connected to it. And then you, you draw all of the, the triples in that set. So, and then you just call that, that particular clump c of x. So you have, for each x, you're going to have one of these, these clumps c of x. Um, OK, and the point is that basically these clumps fit together in a very nice way. So, so the, the key thing here is that if you have any particular pair within this set, then it's contained within two of these different clumps. Alex? This for me was a little bit too fast. Yeah, sure. Instead, in the previous one, in the previous one, I was told that detail. So what's the precise definition now? So I gave two different definitions here. They're equivalent, though. So, um, so the definition is exactly what I was saying. You take x. Um, let's suppose you're working in the Cayley graph with respect to this, this s. So okay. what's the size of this? S will be logarithmic. So, um, all right, so you take the Cayley graph, you look at the collection of things which are connected to x in that Cayley graph, and which is, is what I was doing here. And you define something to be a triangle, you could use triangle, if it's there. So you define it to be, no, what you do is you define it to be a triangle, in this case, if there's a path of length 2 between them. So, so in particular, you'll get triangles because you'll get these two are connected, then these two are connected, and so then these two are connected. You make, you, yeah, you put that in as a, a new edge, in, and then you, you form the triple. So, um, so basically, you look at this star, and then you take all triples in the endpoints of the star. And then you sort of remove this, this center point from it. So, so that's what's happening. And then I just call this thing C of x. OK, so the point somehow with this is that for any edge uh, that's within uh, this hypergraph is actually contained within two of these clumps. So, uh, so the precise thing here is that if x2, x plus s1 plus s2 is a pair that's contained in some triple, then it's actually contained in two of these, these clumps. So it's contained in this one and this one. So I'll, I have some picture here as well. So, so the idea is the following. So you have this, this edge x to x plus s1 plus s2, which is contained in the clump around x plus s1. So the reason for that is that x plus s1 plus s1 is just x, because we're working over f2. Um, and x plus s1 with s2 added just gives you, gives you this. But it's also contained within this clump uh, coming from x plus s2, because you can add s2 to get to here and s1 to get to here. So it's actually contained in, in these two different clumps. 
So, um, so just removing some of the, the outside stuff, uh, this is the, the basic point of the thing. So, so going from here to here, you get S1. Going from here to here, you get S2, and vice versa here. So the really critical thing that's going on here is just the abelianness. So the only thing that I'm actually using is that S1 plus S2 is the same as S2 plus S1. So um, I've been talking about F2 to the T here. There's a generalization that works in all abelian groups, but F2 to the T seems to be the, the easiest way to, to talk about it. Um, so um, the one thing I haven't said here in this construction, um, actually, let me say a little bit more on the board about how this works. Um, so, so why does this help? So what you get is this collection of blobs, which are basically complete graphs within your three uniform guy. And these blobs have centers. And basically, what it's saying is that we have this um, S prime, which is S plus S without zero. It's saying that uh, you form the Cayley graph on this S prime. And that Cayley graph connects these centers. So you get this Cayley graph distinguishing these centers. Now, if S is chosen randomly, for example, then this will be a good expander. So what we get is a collection of blobs whose centers form a good expander. So, so we get this, uh, these blobs whose centers uh, form a nice expander. And within each of these blobs, we have a, a complete thing, which is a good expander. And the important thing is, is that if two blobs are connected like this, then you can walk from one to the other. So there's a triple here, um, such that this pair is then contained within here. And you can, you can keep moving. So, so you can walk around the whole thing. First, you, you walk maybe within the blob. So, so within here, for example, I'd have to take a couple of steps to get over to here. So within this blob, I can sort of walk to something uh, that's in there, and then I can walk back out again. So, so you can sort of percolate within the blobs very easily because it's a complete three uniform thing. And then you can percolate between the blobs because of, of this particular property here. Um, um, so in terms of, if you're using F2 to the T, then, and using this particular <coughs> construction, then, then this is certainly optimal. But, um, but Ramanujan graphs give you bounded degree things, or Ramanujan complexes give you bounded degree things. So there are clearly things that you can do, um, just not using this particular paradigm. But and they have the two properties you're, you're looking for. They have the two properties. I'll talk about that in a second, but they, they have the two properties that I'm, I'm looking for. Sorry? Can we just not pick the whole uh, kind of complete graph, but have do some pseudo-random subgraphs? You can, yeah, you can. Actually, that'll come up in the, the, it's necessary to do that for higher uniformities. We have to do something like that. But, um, so, yes, I think as it, as it stands, you probably need it close to complete. So maybe you can take density a half or something, but I think you need it close to complete. Um, okay, so in terms of picking S, um, one way you can do it is randomly. You don't actually have to pick it randomly, but, um, but you can pick it randomly. What you actually need is that it satisfies these two conditions. So you need that the, um, the second eigenvalue be small. Um, so less than epsilon times D is what I should have put here, or epsilon times S. And you also need this, this extra condition, which just stops some uh, degeneracies in the graph that there is no solutions to the Sidon equation. But that's very easy. If you take a, a sparse thing, it won't contain any solutions to this. Um, and you can do this randomly, or you can just, there are lots of ways to do this explicitly as well. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out is that actually, if you know that this guy is a good expander, then it implies that this thing is also a good expander. Um, so, um, and then if you know the, so therefore if you know this is a good expander, you know this is a good expander, and this picture that I've drawn over here percolates in exactly the right way that I'm, I'm expecting. Okay, so um, I haven't actually defined the notion of, of expansion that I'm working with. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, but here's the, the key idea. So, so given a hypergraph, let's define some, some graph that's associated with it. 
And the graph has vertex sets. So the vertex sets are just the R minus one element sets, which are contained in some edge. So in the three uniform case, you have triples, and you're interested in the pairs that are contained in at least one of those triples. Okay. And then we're going to join two vertices if and only if um, they're contained in a common triple. So, and you can see that this sort of facilitates a walking process as well. Um, and then the definition is just, well, uh, the definition I'm working with is just your or uniform hypergraph is an expander if and only if this associated graph is an expander in the classical sense. So, um, okay. And the main theorem then says that this construction here satisfies this condition. Um, okay, so, uh, so suppose that S is a, a subset of F2 to the T satisfying these conditions, that this second eigenvalue is strictly smaller than S, and there's no non-trivial solutions to the Sidon equation. Uh, then this hypergraph is an expander in, in that particular sense. And it's an expander with respect to um, this, this S that generates. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so in particular, if you take a random thing, then that works. So if you take a random thing, because of this Alan Reuchmann theorem and the remark I said afterwards, you need this to have size c times t for some, some sufficiently large c. Um, which means that if you take n to be the number of vertices in here, which is the number of vertices in your Katie graph, the number of, of edges is n times log cubed. So it doesn't give bounded degree, but it gives something which is close up to some, some polylogarithmic factor. Um, and it has this nice property that it's, uh, it's randomizable, so you can make it random. Uh, so that was asked by several people, actually. So it, a few times it's been alluded to that it would be nice to have some sort of construction that, that worked in, in a random sense. So, um, so I think uh, uh, Parzhenshevsky mentions it in his uh, PhD thesis, for example. <coughs> OK. Um, one way to think about this is um, so buildings are sort of built from, from sheets. So you take. Um, you take a triangulation of the Euclidean plane, and then you have lots of these that sort of overlap with each other in some nice way. I mean, again, I refer, refer you to the poster because it is one of the best pictures I've ever, ever seen of a, of a building. Um, so, so you have these sheets, and you like to fit these sheets together in some, some nice way. What you have over here is, again, something like sheets, except you have these local sheets just surrounding every given point, and then those sheets meet very nicely. So, so in walking from one vertex to its neighbor, you get that the, the join is exact, um, which is, is why this works. Um, OK, so and then just to say a little bit, so the, uh, the random walk aspect. Um, so again, we can just define a random walk by starting with some initial probability distribution. You, you pick some edge, and then you walk from some edge to some other edge that's adjacent to it within this, this associated graph. So this is just a random walk within the associated graph. So you start at an or minus one set, and then you choose randomly one of the things that's contained in, uh, in some edge with that or minus one set, and then you just walk around. And the hope is that you would converge rapidly uh, to the uniform distribution. And that happens here. So, so if you're within this regime, then with high probability, the walk uh, mixes rapidly. So uh, in the context of uh, Ramanujan complexes, there's been a lot of work recently on this. So there's uh, papers of Kaufman and Maas, uh, De Noor and Kaufman, and more recently, uh, Kaufman and Oppenheim. Um, there's some very nice, nice things to be said there, actually. Um, OK, so, so that's the three uniform case. Um, I'll come back to it at the end, actually, because it satisfies other properties besides this uh, this thing, but let me, uh, somehow this is the easiest one to get, keep track of. Um, let me talk about what happens in higher uniformities. So in higher uniformities, this is uh, joint work with Jonathan Tior and uh, Yufei Zhao, both at MIT. Um, so let's go back to the situation we were in before. So you have, um, we have this thing that if you have an edge x to x plus s plus s1 plus s2, then it's contained within the clump around here and the clump around here. So you can sort of walk from this clump to this clump. 
Um, let me rearrange that diagram slightly. Um, so it's the same thing. All you've done is shift by a, an S1 or change X plus S1 to X. Um, so, so if you have an edge between X plus S1 and X plus S2, then it's contained in clump X and clump X plus S1 plus S2. So, so what we would like in the four uniform case is we would like that we have a clump around this X and we have a clump around whatever this guy is uh, that contains all three of these points. So we have some, some, uh, some triple, which is a face of a four uniform thing. And we'd like to say that this triple is contained in this X and contained in something else. So, so just looking at it this way, um, if this is X, then this is X plus S1, this is X plus S2, and this is X plus S3. It becomes apparent very quickly that what you need to make this work is you need to make this S2 plus S3, this has to be S1 plus S3, and this has to be S3 plus S1 plus S2. So the same idea means that up to some translation, this just has to be this, this, and this. Okay. So, so that looks kind of hopeful to begin with, but unfortunately, it shows that uh, if this is going to work, then you need to be closed under addition. So, so if S1 and S2 are in there, then S1 plus S2 also needs to be in your generating set. So, um, and, and so on. So, but if that's true, then uh, the set being closed under addition, we also need that this S has to be a generating set for F2 to the T. So it forms a basis, and you're just going to get everything. So actually, what I just said doesn't work. So there's, there's nothing really that you can do to make this work if you're using complete things. So, so what you have to do somehow is you have to f try and find some way that instead of using all of the, the triples coming out, or all of the quadruples coming out, you need to use some, some distinguished subset. Um, so the main idea uh, for how one makes this work, so, and the key problem at this point is you want to find some collection of S1, S2, S3, such that if S1, S2 is in your set, then S1 plus S2 is also in your set. Um, so this is, is now the key thing. Um, the key idea comes from coding theory, um, and it's to do with uh, just constant weight codes. So, so if we take these uh, three vectors over uh, F2 to the 7, then well, all I've done here is I've written out all of the basis vectors uh, downwards like this, so 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and et cetera. So that's all of the basis vectors just um, written out. Then this has a really nice property that actually, if you take sum of any two of these things, then the resulting thing has the same Hamming weight. So, so the Hamming weight of each of these is 4, and the Hamming weight of the sum is also still just 4. So, so in some sense, we haven't left so we've stayed within the collection of things with, with Hamming wave 4. Um, so, so in particular, uh, if we, let's see, let me say a little bit more. So, um, so this is what we had. And just rewriting it, you can rewrite it as uh, T1 is the basis vector E1. Um, if I call this E1, E2, E3, call this E1, 2 to mark the fact that it's um, it's at the position where we have a 1 in the first one and a 1 in the second one, then E2, 3, um, sorry, E1, 3, E2, 3, E1, 2, 3. Then uh, we take T1 to be the collection of, you sum over all these basis vectors um, that contain 1. So you get E1, E1, 2, E1, 3, and E1, 2, 3, and so on. So this contains all the basis vectors that contain 2 in the index set. This contains 3 in the index set. And then you take Ti to be the, the sum of, of these guys. So the plan at this point is to use this constant weight code and to replace these EIs with SIs. So I have my random subset of F2 to the T. And the way I'm going to define edges is I'm going to use this formula, but with these EIs replaced with, with SIs. I'm sorry, can you explain the location the index 1, 2, for example? Yeah, so all I've done here, so. Uh, so this is like E1 up to E7. These are the basis vectors for this. So I should do it over here. Um, so this is E1 up to E7. But I've relabeled this as being E1, 2, because it's a 1 in the first slot and then 1 in the second slot, and, and so on. So. Sorry? It's 
jewel it's the jewel of the hamming code, yeah, exactly. Um, it has some other names, but it's a, it's a standard thing in coding theory. Simplex code, Simplex code that's right. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so what do you actually do now? So one thing that you can do is, okay, so let's take, so you fix your uniformity or, let's take all non-trivial subsets of one of the or, and now let's take um, a collection of um, two to the or tuples, or two to the or minus one tuples, from S that are all distinct. So I put something in the first slot, something in the second slot, something in the third slot, and so on. Um, and then what I do is, so I have my X, and then around my X I have this, this ball, but I'm only going to connect things if they're of this variety. So, um, so if, uh, so here you sum over all indices that contain a one in the first case, and then you, you get that sum, and then you sum over all indices that contain a two, you get that sum, and then three and so on. Um, and if you do this, this, this actually works. So, um, so basically all of your edges are just those edges. So you don't contain everything within your clump. You just contain the edges that correspond to edges of this form. Um, okay, so your clumps are actually significantly bigger, um, but they still fit together in a nice way. And the reason they fit together in a nice way is exactly because of this, uh, this constant weight uh, codes that I was talking about. Um, there's a slight lie here because this doesn't actually work. Um, so it works very well in odd uniformities. Um, so the proof that this works is significantly uh, more difficult than the proof in the or equals three case. Um, but also if you, if you follow this through, it turns out that it only works in the odd case. There are certain symmetries that you need that don't exist in the even case if you do this. So the thing that we actually work with is something slightly more complicated that I'm, I'm not really going to explain exactly how it works. Um, so in the odd case, it's very similar to what I talked about. So you, you're interested in um, the collection of sets that you're interested in are just all subsets of one of the or of size less than or over two. Um, and in the even case, you have the same thing, but then you take basically half of the sets of size um, of size or over 2. Um, and then the triples are defined in the same way. So you just, you use this set P instead of the set Q to define which, which triples are allowed. Um, okay. All right, with that, um, so this idea using this constant weight codes on top of, of uh, using elementary abelian two groups, um, you get this theorem, which looks very similar actually. So if you know that the second eigenvalue of um, this Cayley graph with respect to S has some spectral gap, and there are no trivial, no non-trivial solutions to the, uh, the generalized Sidon equation up to some, some two to the or, then the hypergraph is again an expander in the sense that I, I had before. So, um, okay. Um, and in particular, if you take a random subset, then you get a, an expander out of this. Um, and I've sort of put the rest in, so you need the random walk also, mixes rapidly. Um, so, uh, of course, the question is how many edges are contained in this? So, so it's a lot more than was in the previous case, but it's still polylogarithmic. So, so if you have n vertices, the number of vertices is n times some polylogarithmic factor, but now the exponent is exponential, basically. Um, and not sure that this is best possible, actually, but we sort of, um, we got to the point where we, we had something, and it looked like anything we were going to do was going to give something exponential. So we, we stuck with this. One nice feature of this is that actually the exact example I've given here reduces to the, what I talked about in the or equals three case. Um, so, so it is a direct generalization of what happens in the or equals three case, whereas, Uh, so it's just the same thing. The, so this thing here, it's, it's the same thing. So you reduce from the hypergraph to the associated graph. And then if you're an expander within the associated graph, then you're an expander in the hypergraph. <coughs> so we just considered what would happen at or minus 1. You could definitely consider what happens in between. In fact, I've, we're not quite finished this paper yet, and I've been meaning to look at that. So. Um, so I think probably it is the case. So in the three uniform case, it's certainly the case because 
the thing it's based on is just the kalygraph. Um, so, and I think it's probably the case here, but I haven't I haven't checked it yet. Um, okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so you get this this nice expansion property. Okay. So, so let me make uh, a few remarks to to finish. Um, one is that um, we actually know some more general things that happen here. So, so one is uh, this thing here that actually, let's go back to the three uniform case. So we know that if you take three large vertex subsets of, uh, in the three uniform case, then the number of edges spanning those three things, so it was one vertex in A, one vertex in B, and one vertex in C, is the same as what you have in a random random graph of the same density, or random hypergraph of the same density. So um, uh, I don't believe this is known for Ramanujan complexes, actually. I think it's probably true, but I don't know if it's actually known. Um, uh, so it's known if A, B, and C are a partition of, of the vertex set, but possibly not if they're, they're smaller sets. Um, it is known that it follows from some spectral conditions. So there's um, there's a sort of analog of the, the Cheeger inequality that gives this, but I think the spectrum of Ramanujan complexes is, is a bit nasty around the edges. I forget exactly, but um, I think this is true. I think Ari has some paper on this. But, um, so I'm, am I right in what I say here, that, um, that you know that, um, that if A, B, and C partition the set, then you get the right number of, of edges in a Ramanujan complex between A, B, and C, but if they're smaller, you don't necessarily know this. So, I think that I think that's true. So I, I don't actually need them to be linear. You can go smaller than linear here. Yeah. I don't know. So there's a paper by Golubev and Parzhenkovsky. Um, so which which proves this, but they prove it just for a, for a partition, is my belief. Now, I think at least one of the authors is here, so, um, or two of them, okay. <laughs> so they might be able to answer. Um, so I believe this isn't, no, I'm, I'm sure it's true for Ammonutian complexes, but I don't know how to prove it. Um, and actually, as pointed out by, um, by, I forget whose paper, this is probably in a paper by Rosenthal, Tesler, and uh, Varzhenshevsky, um, you can use Pox overlap lemma to use this condition to show that you have a, a geometric expander. So, so you can get a, a geometric expander out of this. The thing that I, I've tried to prove a little bit but haven't been successful with is that I think actually this thing might be a topological expander. Um, and I'm not 100% how to sh sh show this. I wasn't even able to classify the, the cochains in here. Um, so, so I think this might be an interesting question and something, something worth looking at. <coughs> Yeah, having the topological overlap property. Yeah. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, so the uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, so um, so I'm using abelian groups somehow to to produce these expanders, which is clearly the wrong thing to do. I mean, the first thing I said was that it can't give you anything optimal. You need this this logarithmic degree. So, is there some way to use um, to use Cayley graphs over, the, over other groups um, to build uh, things with the same properties, but which have smaller degree. So, and in some sense, the answer is yes, because you can write down explicitly what uh, the Ramanujan complex is, and it ends up being some, some Cayley graph. But what I want is a sort of general mechanism for doing this, akin to the sort of work that's, that's been done for graphs. We'd like to have some general mechanism for producing hypergraph expanders from, uh, from Cayley graphs. Okay, so there's, there's more that I can say, but I, I think I'm finished a little early, but I will, uh, I'll, I'll stop there.